You're listening to Journaling with PT. I am your host, artist, PT Russell. Today I had the honor of interviewing a very prolific independent filmmaker, the person of Sam Borowski. Unfortunately, the recording is riddled with technical issues. It was a a wonderful conversation to hear him retell much of his filmography. And I believe if you can bear the sound of the interference, you will have an enriching experience. So without further ado, my guest. Hello, everyone. I have a special treat for you today. If you are a movie buff or a film aficionado, you're in for something really special. All the way from Staten Island, New York, I have a man of many talents. He's a filmmaker, a producer, director, author, writer, teacher, mentor. The list goes on and on. I'm speaking of the person of Sam Borowski. Welcome, Sam. Thank you, PT. I'm really, really thrilled and delighted to be here. And it's funny, you in New York, I just blocked away from in the Godfather, the Corleone home. Still there, by the way. I think they sold oh, wow. it for like $9 million a few years ago. I think right. it was like 9 or $10 million. Nice house. Uh, and I remember my parents, when we used to walk when I was a little kid, and we'd go for walks, uh-huh. they used to take us all the way up to, it was like four blocks away, but it's up like, you got to go up a hill and then turn on the street. I think it's Longfellow yeah. Street. Don't quote me. And when we go there, they say, that's where they filmed The Godfather. You know, when you're three or four, you don't really know what The Godfather is. <laughs> but I remember it. And uh, I, you know, I, I don't doubt that that played a role in me being a filmmaker. That's awesome. The, the Coleo and home, the whole deal. Sounds like a good time. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it's, and it stayed with me. And then ironically, He was introduced to me by who's a mentor of mine, produced something like 40 pictures. And he introduced me to Al Ruddy. Al produced The Godfather and Million Dollar Baby, among many others. But he won an Oscar for each of those films. Only producer to go up and get an Oscar on stage for The Godfather. Wow. That's an accomplishment. So it came full circle for me. I guess I was destined to be a filmmaker. Yes, it's in your blood, man, in your bones. It is in my blood because my cousin was Oscar-nominated actor Danny Aiello, uh, who passed a few years ago. Said we lost Danny. Danny was another great inspiration to me. Yeah, um, I remember. Yeah, like I used to call him on the phone and get advice, and he's up there. And I always say the main reason I became a writer, director, producer, you know, filmmaker, was actually John Travolta. Because I grew up wanting to be him. And I could see the Verrazano Bridge from my childhood home in Staten Island. I could see the bridge. And I was too young to see Saturday Night Fever in a theater. My, my mom wouldn't take me. You know, it was rated R. And, but it was a different world back then. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like, we didn't have the internet like we do today. Not in the same way like we have an internet today where everything. But they had a lot of commercials. You would buy the record album for a movie and we listened to the songs and I saw the pictures and they had commercials left and right about the movie. And you even watch the movie reviews like on channel 11, WPIX yeah. and Fox, you know, uh, channel five and CBS uh, channel two in, in New York, ABC seven. So it, it NBC channel four, you would watch them, you know, I want to see that. And they came out with a PG 13 version and my mom said, okay, I'll, I'll take you to that. Now, who wants oh. to go see the PG-13? Not PG-13, <laughs> I'm wrong. There was no PG-13 yet. It was called PG. They, like, cut out curses and all the debauchery. <laughs> and she's like, I'll take you to that. You could see the dancing. I could watch the dancing, my Italian aunt, all night. My Aunt Natalie, actually. And What a soundtrack, eh? Say that again? The soundtrack. Oh, 
I didn't go because I wanted to see the PG version. Then it came to cable TV. <laughs> and a lot of times in the summer, my cousin, Jeffrey Anaruma, would sleep over. And uh, his father once dubbed him the, lo- the loudest animal alive. And he and I would always cause trouble. And we would sleep in the den, you know, not my room. We had a pull-out couch. And we right. would watch all the movies we weren't supposed to. Saturday Night Fever was one of them. We watched that. And we watched The Warriors. Uh, wow. And it's like, you felt like you were getting away with something. But, you know, I was blown away. I mean, John Travolta, even at a really early age, not old enough to see an R-rated movie, you could see he dominated the screen. Yeah. You know, you could see. Cool, eh? he was He's the king of cool. I've always felt that. Although, that's not my favorite performance of his. Do you know what it is, PT? I think you might. Get Shorty? Get Shorty is my favorite movie of all time and my favorite performance of John's. I just think it was such a perfect marriage of actor and material. It came from an Elmore Leonard novel. He's my favorite writer. So my favorite writer's novel was adapted by Scott Frank, the screenwriter, and they got my favorite actor. And of course it would be, but I love Get Shorty. I call it a new age classic from MGM. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just, it's it's like an old screwball monster comedy but in the new age so that's my favorite but uh, you know my top 10 movies are very eclectic yes yes i do but i wanted to touch on this speaking of accomplishments we were talking about accomplishments earlier your accomplishment with your short film mandala maker oh yes we we qualified for the oscars with that yeah we qualified for the oscars with that that helped break me out in the industry and it's a very special memory. And I really enjoyed making that, um, not an easy film to make on our budget. And, uh, you know, we had a real budget for a short film. We didn't have like a thousand dollars. We had more, but we didn't have usually for Oscar qualifiers, they put in 10 to 20 grand and we didn't have that. We had under that. And, um, but we had real crew, real, equipment real actors daniel roebuck was in it um the girl courtney hogan who played the lead was excellent um uh we had we had so many uh, eric stein who was on big brother the tv show ironically um he's he's uh he's he was known as america's player he's one of the most famous big brother players of all time he's in it he's the annoying customer in the bagel store that causes her to have uh a nervous breakdown. We had so many wonderful act. Terrence, Terrence uh, Mann was in that, and uh, you know he's he won the Tony for playing John Lennon in Lennon, and he was Beast in Beauty and the Beast, and he's done a bunch of movies. And Terrence Mann is in it, uh, and we filmed that at the um, at at the Rubin Museum of Art, it, which is very prestigious. Uh, they they even have a theater in there. We never actually screened in there, but uh, we should have. But uh, it, it it was it was I one love of my the art. Yeah, the, and art, that, the, the art is actually beautiful. The art is very beautiful. You see yes. a lot of real mandalas. In. Yes, it was lovely, and it, that's a major accomplishment. And what? How did that shape you? I mean, like, uh, did it change anything having that uh, that accomplishment? And yeah, I think uh, it. I think it inspired me. I think it showed me what you can accomplish. Because when you qualify for the Oscars, you're only a handful of films, then you make a cut down to ten, and then it's like I'm going to get the nomination, and then you know, then your dreams are crushed. But but it's it's not really like that. It's like you you just qualify or you get to the ten. Then you're like, you start thinking about it because they wrote about me in the New York Daily News. I'm going to get an Oscar nomination. And right at the last moment when they come out with them and you don't get one, you're like, all right, I came that close. They don't tell you you were six or you were 10 or anything like that. They just, you know, uh, but it's like, wow, to come that close, you know, That's and, and to play it that high. I learned a lot of things about getting publicity. We were very top heavy in publicity and then we kind of petered it out before the nominations. And uh, I kind of wished I'd played a couple extra festivals, won an extra award, got a little more publicity. But to play at that high level, it, it really, you know, opened my eyes. Like I, I heard, uh, I once met this male actor. He says, I'm going to win an Oscar. And he doesn't do his homework and he doesn't know his lines. He was in my class at one point. And 
you know what? To play at that high level, you got to really, really, you know, I heard Matt Damon say, and this goes for acting, directing, screenwriting, producing. But he said, to be a director, you have to work harder than you ever have at anything in your life. And that goes for any part of this industry. And when you talk about the Academy Awards level, you know, it's just such a high level. And I don't tell people they can't do it, but you got to do the work. It can't be a joke to you. You know, um, I've come across, I've always said I got into this business to tell stories. I'm a storyteller. But I've come across some wonderful actors, obviously known actors. Um, I had the privilege of meeting the man I grew up wanting to be, John Travolta, twice once to discuss a project. Um, sure. And I also worked with Oscar winner Ernie Borg, Oscar winner Benicio Del Toro. Natasha oh, that's own, a nightclub, right? Yeah, club. And Natasha Leone was in that very polarizing actor, but she's very talented. She's been in about eight or ten of my projects. Um, Mary Domino was a stand-up comedian in New York. She's a Gracie Allen Award winner. She uh, won the Mac Award for Best Female Comedian, Mario Cantone won for Best Male Comedian the same year. There's a great picture of them. Uh, she, I mean, she's done so much. The New York Fringe Festival, which is like the can for musicals and plays. It's, it's a theater festival in New York, probably the biggest one. She won it one year for Best One Person Play Scared Skinny. Then her play, Big Dummy, about her father uh, was nominated. It didn't win, but I think to this point, I don't think any one person show has ever won twice they've been nominated and she sold out every performance she's another one uh i've just i've met so many wonderful people one of the people i took under my wing kevin brody he actually he's in my acting class and still taking it but he'll be taking it remotely for two months until december because he just uh auditioned in mount airy north carolina to be in a christmas carol which will star daniel roebuck as scrooge and it's in the historic Andy Griffith uh, Playhouse. And he's someone I took under my wing. Uh, most recently, I discovered a young actress, Alexandra Doggett. She is very talented. Uh, wow. She lives up in Albany. Uh, and I never knew there was this girl in Albany that had all this talent. Not that that's a knock on Albany. But, you know, it's a little far away from Hollywood and New York City. And she just shows that there are people out there that are filled with talent. There's been others. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Some of their names escape me. Or uh, a lot of talent. A lot of a lot of other to be discovered, and uh, mm. because I take my craft so seriously, I take whether it's screenwriting, directing, producing, I take it all seriously, and I want it to be great. And I don't, I don't want to put something out there. That's, uh, I don't want to use a bad word. That's, you know, like dog do do. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to put it out because I, listen, yeah, yeah. I did something better in post. You're always going to realize I could have done it better. You'll never make the perfect movie. You might come close, but I see too many people that put slip shot and they don't, you know, if you're playing a homeless man in a movie, you better have stubble or a beard and look dirty not clean with slick back hair you better not wear a rolex these are right. these are things i've seen and i'm like really i don't care if your budget was 1500 you know if people are volunteering you could still make a great movie uh you know i like that yeah you, you really can and i'll tell you something uh, very resourceful matter of fact yeah well one more thing i, I mentioned alexandra doggett i call her alex I've seen her be in projects, and this is a testament to her, the filmmakers, everybody. Uh, I guess they were filmed in upstate New York that are excellent, that are excellent. I just saw her in a sci-fi sh uh, short, uh, and I'm, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name. But it, uh, Subtle Perfection. See? See? Now, now no one could be mad at me. But it was excellent, and I told her that when, when I was with her and Kevin. You know, and I Kevin just did a short, and can make a great short without a lot of money if you have talent and if you get volunteers i'm not saying don't raise the most money you can't do that but you're never going to raise the amount you want like film for two million dollars and sounds like a lot it's not a lot 
because then you're dealing with these name actors. You get an Oscar winner, and it's like two million is not that much. And then you get like uh, you get uh, you rent clothes if you're in filming in LA from Universal Studios, and you'll see the budget go up. And and I've done that on movies where I rent the clothes. I'm not going to say the budget, of course. You never want to reveal that. But what I am going to say is you rent clothes from Universal because they have exactly what you want and you use practical locations, not a soundstage. And you realize, you see how the budget goes up just to feed the, the cast and crew. And I'm going to tell you this, you got to feed your cast and crew well, uh, whether they're working for a lot of money, a little, or donating their time. You have to feed them and treat them well. Uh, we did a short in Bethlehem with Danny Roebuck and my student, Sarah Harmon, called In This Moment. And we got as a sponsor... Dickie's Pit Barbecue, and they gave us great barbecue, like pulled pork oh. and brisket. And... Now I want to be on the set. <laughs> no, I always feed them well. And I'm not going to say you never have pizza on. You, I mean, inevitably, you're going to have to have pizza night, too. But you got to get a lot of pizza, and you get starters, and you get salad, and you get things for everybody, you know, if, if you can. Uh, but But I always feed them well, and even when it's pizza once in a while, you get other stuff. You get a, one year, I did a feature called Rex out in Georgia. Produced. It was like the second or third thing I worked on. And uh, directed by Christopher Miller. I uh, had some fine actors in it. The robot was Wayne Worker from Pulp Fiction. Kelly Kennedy, who was the mother of Sling Blade, Billy Bob Thornton Sling Blade. And I don't know, it was, it was about a, two weeks before I went out there. And uh, I was watching QVC little plug for QVC. They're not sponsoring me, but yeah, I'm one of those. And I saw they had like these Nathan's hot dog nuggets. They were corn dogs, but little bite size, no stick, just the little ones. And like the cocktail Franks, but Nathan's brand in the cornbread. And I got like a bunch of boxes of them to go when we were going to have pizza. And they had blueberry bread pudding. And they put me on the air and they're like, sir, you're a movie producer. And I, I never, I wanted to get that footage to put it as an extra on the DVD. I didn't. But I remember I called up the director, Christopher Miller, and I said, I'm going to be, I gave your address, QV sending this. Do you have the QVC sending this? Do you have a big freezer? And he said, yeah, yeah, we do. And I remember the first day of filming, we had pizza, but we had the, co- the hot dog nuggets and the kids. We were filming children that day. It was a flashback scene and they went nuts. And then we had the blueberry pudding and it was, Oh, it, it, was, it was it was fun that I got it from QVC and that they put me on the air. But that's just a funny little silly story. I'm sure yeah. that's not why you had me on today. <laughs> hey, hey, I want you just, uh, just to go for it, man. This is good stuff. This is all the nitty gritty. <laughs> and uh, about your the, the short film, Maniac, uh, how, how was the process uh, for the writing for that film? compared to the other films that you did, the other short, especially uh, for a mandala maker? So that's an interesting question. It's interesting you asked it because we didn't discuss this before, but mm-hmm. I kind of uh, ghost wrote that. There was a, a, a film student I had who used to be my assistant um, and uh, Nehad Shalabi. He was from Egypt. Great guy. He used to bring me lunch every day. I didn't even ask him. He knew what I liked. He'd be like, and he'd go to 7-Eleven and get a coffee and he'd bring me a hot dog, you know, and, and my unsweet teas. Nehad an idea came to me and I kind of wrote it with him. Like, it was mostly written, but it needed some changes and some things. And I didn't take a writing credit on that one, but I did co-write it and I directed it. And right. it was just a different process because he came to me with an idea and like a half-written script. And I took a liking to it. And what I really liked and it's still a hot button topic today and I'm not going to comment on it either way because I'm not mm-hmm. here to tick people off or give them my opinion oh, uh, no. on, on, on you know, on living, but on the gun control issue and I'm not speaking for or against it right now. I'm just talking about it. It was a hot button topic and I thought, well, here's a way we could let the audience decide. Because I've always said when, when I co-wrote it and I directed it, that that's not a black or white movie. It's a shades of gray movie. And you see things and one side will be C, C, and then the other side will be, well, look at this. And I, I wanted to leave it up to the audience what they thought, because it's about a mentally disturbed man and he loses his daughter. 
they didn't have insurance and the doctor didn't operate on her. And, and now you got to suspend a little disbelief because my sister, uh, she works Patricia McMillan in the health industry. And she tells me usually it's uh, unlike John Q, the movie, when, mm-hmm. when you don't have insurance, they give you emergency insurance and then they, they say, you owe a hundred thousand dollars and they write it off. I, yeah, I don't, I do research, but this was years ago, but there are mm-hmm. cases, you know, and I, case where you know he didn't operate on the girl and the girl dies and the guy goes nuts and he becomes a vigilante killing what he deems are bad people. most of them are bad people one guy's gonna rob a store and kill someone and oh that johnny oh my goodness and you wanted to hate him eh right right and he's gonna <laughs> oh he's gonna he did such an excellent job with that character the 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 um, guy who played the robber right yeah, I think this is, his name is D'Onofrio, if I'm not mistaken. No, oh, you're taking Joey D'Onofrio was the pimp. Uh, oh, okay. He's from Goodfellas and A Bronx Tale. He was slick in A Bronx Tale. He was the young Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. He was very good as the pimp. Uh, no, Anthony, um, he was one of my students, too. See, I give my students uh, chances. Uh, he was Italian. It was a little while ago now, so this is this is 10 years ago, but... Anthony was in that. And then I don't know if you know, recognize the store owner, the African-American man with the shaved head. He's from the yeah, Warriors. I- That's David Harris. He was Cochise in the Warriors, one of the main Warriors. He's in the whole movie, makes it to the end because some of them die. You know, they're, it's a gang. And they think that they shot this guy, Cyrus, who was trying to unite all the gangs in New York. And they didn't. They get framed. And they're trying to make it from the Bronx back to Coney Island, Brooklyn. That's a long way on the subways if every gang in the city is trying to kill you. <laughs> so that's like the premise of the Warriors. And David was one, he had a big afro back then, but now he's older. And he said to me, uh, not what he said to me on the phone before I met him, now I'm the baldy, Sam. I shaved my head. That was funny he said that. Accurate, but, but no, he's very great. And he did a great job with that. And... Uh, that's one of my favorite scenes is the scene in the deli. And we talk about how this guy actually as a vigilante does some good, but he also does bad. And he kills the doctor in the very opening. You don't know till the end what he did. You just hear him kill someone in the house and he runs out. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's not, to me, it's a shades of gray issue. You got to look at. And I just wanted to start a dialogue with people. I'm not, it's not, I'm not saying I'm against the right to bear arms. I'm saying that I wanted to start it. See, that's the problem with my country today. There's no dialogue. It's this way or it's that way. You know, it's my way or the it's, highway. It's just your country. It's it's everywhere, pretty much. Well, I know in America there's no dialogue. And it's okay to disagree. I disagree with some people vehemently politically, but I don't hate them. I don't, oh, you're not coming to my house for Thanksgiving if you vote for this person. And I think it's ridiculous. I think it's, and it's really getting to a dangerous point with free speech, you know, and, and I don't want to get on a diatribe, but I, why yeah. can't there be a dialogue? When I was a kid, Democrats and Republicans didn't hate each other. They more like mocked each other uh, kind of sarcastically, but they would work together when they had to. Now, please you know and it's i'm not taking either side and this is why i always say i'm not a political person per se because i may you know i vote i believe in the importance of standing up what you believe in but why can't we you know have a dialogue about things if we had a dialogue what a better world this would be and i'll tell you something else that i think you'll get a kick out of i just kind of paraphrase something john gallagher was a big independent director in new york he made a movie called the deli Blue Moon with Ben Gazzara. He worked with a lot of the guys from The Sopranos and The Deli, which is a funny comedy. Mike Starr was in it, but who's a big character actor. But John Gallagher said once in a bar, I think it was Saga in New York. It was in New York City. I think it was Saga, a famous bar he used to go to. And we'd have drinks and starters. And he said, Sam, if every independent filmmaker helped every independent filmmaker, what a better business it would be. And I always like that. And I, again, that goes for actors and filmmakers, producers, directors, writers. If we all helped each other instead of fighting each other, what a better business it would be. Yeah, only yeah, and the w- WGA, well, they had their decision. How do you feel about that? Well, I think uh, it's good that they got a settlement. You know, and and I support the WGA, of course, and 
uh, you know, this AI is a very, I don't want to get into it. It gets me upset, but uh, yeah. you can't have AI acting roles and writing scripts. It's, it's not the same thing. Uh, and I think the actors are going to follow suit. I think they're going to get a, uh, a settlement, although right now they're not close, which, which really, excuse my French, sucks. They were in talks and then it fell apart. Yeah, again. it fell apart. But I think they are going to have to give in to the actors because why would you give in to the, us writers and not the actors? You need the actors. The actors you are need important. The talent to make a movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, when I write a script, do you know I rarely audition hundreds of people because I already know who I want? And unless they're Leonardo oh, okay, DiCaprio, that's the trick. Which, you know, if they're Leonardo DiCaprio, chances are I may not get them. But if they're a big name actor, like a two time Oscar nominee, or I got Benicio in Creature Feature, Six Years of the Gill Man. And although that was documentary, it was still. You know, and I got Ernie Borgnine, the Oscar winner, and Natasha Leone and Daniel Roebuck and Keith David twice. So, you know, like I put actors in mind and backup actors that may be big, but ones I can get to. I've worked with before. I know. I know someone who knows. And then I have up and coming actors that I often think of for roles. You know, um, people like Kevin Brody, people like Alexandra Doggett. These are people I want to work with. And I've said that. Because when I see their talent and I, for all the young actors out there, I, I do once a month an acting workshop, Sam Borowski. So you want to be an actor. And because of the pandemic, I now offer it virtually. People come in person, but you'll get just as much virtually as you will out of it in person. And I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I mm -hmm. I've discovered people in that class and I really help them. But nothing bothers me more when I take an interest like uh uh, and I'm not talking about anybody specific today, um, right. you know, but I'm talking people that I hadn't even, they reached out to me. So I had like Alex, I discovered and I saw her work. Uh, Kevin, I had met before and he took people whose work I've never seen. And they reach out to me and they say, Sam, would you consider putting me in a movie? Well, I haven't seen a reel. I haven't seen your work. Why don't you take the class? And they immediately say, I'm, I'm not interested in the class, but, oh, but I'll help you. Sure. Like what world are they living in? Because like somebody like Kevin, I knew of his work before he joined the class. Um, I hadn't seen a lot of it, but I knew that I met him and he had all this passion. Alex, I saw her work and it was great. And I knew it was great. Um, and uh, actually I'm recruiting her for the class. Uh, hopefully she'll take it. Uh, you know, she's got some things going on right now, but I hope she does take it. She's uber talented. But if I've never seen anything by you, you can't message me on Facebook and say, hey, you got to put me in your movie. That's And that's something that actually happened. I don't have to put you in my movie. Like, why would I do that? Are you any good? Take a class. You know, I'm not interested in the class, but keep me in mind when you do. No, I'm not going to. I'm going to go to my students first because I know they work and they still have to earn it. And if they're not ready. I'll go to, I have a wide network of actors. So, you know, you should, it's not just about the class, but it's about getting on my radar and getting on any independent filmmaker's radar. I think enough up and coming actors don't do that. Thing I'll say about Alex is she does a million projects. I mean, I've seen her in all these, she went to, I can't believe her, Montclair State. Montclair State. I don't want her to never talk to me again. Uh, she went to Montclair State, which is known for theater and film. And she did like projects there and people's thesis films. And, and she was originally a theater person and uh, you could just see she has it. You know, one producer said to me, I showed him her work and he said, she's a natural Kevin being in the class. Dwayne Whitaker was a guest judge. I do a class the weekend of the Oscars every year, the night before day before the Saturday before, and we give out best actor and best actress in the class. And then they have to read a speech. And it's not silly. It's not, oh, thank you, everybody. Like, they have to really give a speech. And I always compare to the Devil Wears Prada. Because, you know, Meryl Streep's like, why should I hire you? What experience do you have? And Anne Hathaway goes, I think I could be really good in this job. And, and that's just childish. And, you know, even though she is torturous to Anne Hathaway, there's a great point. Uh, that um, the Italian actor, Nigel, he plays Nigel, makes to her, uh, I see his name in my head. Uh, he's a great actor. Uh, oh, it just popped in and out. The short uh, man with the shaved head. 
oh man, I, anyway, he's, he, his name is Italian. And he, he said to her, these halls that everyone is dying to work in, you know, at this famous magazine that's supposed to be Vogue. He said, you only deign to work here. And he's right. You know, like she, she thinks it's a joke. Fashion's a joke. And why would you hire that person? But Meryl Streep sees something in her, even though she tortures her and she hires her and she teaches her about being professional. And I love that. And when we do the speeches in the Oscar class, I don't want to hear some silly speech. Uh, you know, when I gave a speech at a film festival after my mom passed, I talked all about my mom and I was crying. And you even the small. Even if it's the Staten Island advance, it's not a store, actually. It's in the new house chain and jewel of the new house chain. It's not anymore with the North Star Ledger and the Sacramento Bee and all those, but it's still a big paper. If they're there, film festival, and maybe someone from the New York Daily News is there, and you got podcasts like you do, you're going to get noticed. And you also have filmmakers who might want to work with you and investors. So take that chance to, to I mean, don't go up and go, I want to throw up right now. Thank you. That was an actual speech I heard uh, <laughs> at, at, at a film festival. <laughs> that, that was a first year film festival. And someone actually said that. And I was like, really? You just had a golden opportunity. And there's opportunities when you're sitting in a deli in New York City. You don't know what's behind you. Or in Los Angeles, you could meet someone out on the street. Or in New Jersey, uh, you know, you don't know. Or... Uh, even with someone like Alex, she was suggested. And then I, I was like, yeah, she's beautiful, but can she work? And then I saw her work, fell in love with the work. She was that good. Turns out she could sing. She sang in a short film. And I was like, this girl could sing. And I didn't know she had a theater background until I spoke to her. Uh, and then I, you know, I did my research and I was like, this girl is a natural. And same thing with Kevin. I didn't know as much about him. We were friends for a month before he took the class, but he told me he was, he was an actor, wanted to learn producing and screenwriting, and I agreed to write a script with him. He came and paid me something. He said, would you write this script for me? But I want to learn the process. And then I saw how passionate he was, and then I saw him in the class, and he could act. I saw more of his acting, and it's like, yeah, I will always work with people like that, you know? I will always work with them. The people that don't want to put forth an effort, no, I won't work with, but People like Kevin and Alex, I will. Uh, you know, my student, Sarah Harmon, I told you we did a short film. Her, her sister published the short story. I think it's called The Day of Grayfield Arboretum. And we changed it to In This Moment. I got the rights for the short film. Adapted it into a script. You talk about the writing process. I changed some names. It's a sim very similar story, but I changed some names. I just wanted it to be believable and a contemporary story that that you know took place any any town in america and uh it, it's something we're real proud of and her the bulk of it is her and daniel roebuck sitting on a park bench we made danny look like he's 85 years old he is not 85 years old that's like 30 years older than he is and basically we made him look five and it was realistic with makeup artists we had so many people that volunteered in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where he is making a lot of faith-based movies. He directs and stars. And uh, he did a great one that was just playing in theaters called Lucky Louie. And even though it's out of theaters now, I think he does some one night screenings here and there. So you might catch it. It's going to come streaming. And uh, I believe it'll be DVD, Blu-ray and streaming soon. It's a very good movie, Lucky Louie. And it was the last role, um, for Basil Hoffman, who was a great character actor. And one of the greatest stories is that Basil did all these big character roles, like in a movie, uh, Night, Night Shift, which there's an homage to in Night Club, which was Ron Howard's second directorial effort. But the first he ever did for a major studio, Warner's, uh, his, his first movie, uh, which was, I believe, it was either Eat My Dust or Grand Theft Auto. I believe it was... It was Grand Theft Auto, and I believe it was, um, I believe it was for Roger Corman. But the second movie was I'm showing my my movie knowledge or lack thereof that I almost forgot. Yes, <laughs> um, but no, his second movie was Night Shift, 
Uh, and it was the first feature by Michael Keaton and Shelley Long was in it. I believe it was her first, first feature. And it's about three very special friends and two of them work in the morgue. And one is a hooker and her pimp gets killed and she's beat up. And she's like, Chuck, we need a pimp because he's her neighbor, Henry Winkler. And Michael Keaton gets the brilliant idea to run these hookers out of the morgue. And they'll be kind to them and they'll get them a health plan <laughs> and they'll invest their money. And, you know, uh, Basil, they do eventually get arrested, the two guys. And Basil has to talk to Henry Winkler and Michael Keaton about how they can get off. He's the lawyer. And it's a funny scene. He was in, I mean, he was in a lot of movies, um, a lot of movies. I want to, I want to say he was in Catch Me If You Can, but I, I don't have his filmography in front of me, but he was in a lot of movies over the years. But I love Night Night Shift is one of my 15 favorite movies of all time. Hence why I did homage in Night Club. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so I loved Basil. And, and his first starring lead role came in Lucky Louie. And he passed a year after that. Do you believe that? But it's a beautiful yeah. movie if you get a chance to see it. It, it was actually not written and directed by Daniel right. Roebuck. It was written and directed by Daniel Roebuck and his daughter, Grace Roebuck, who came out of film school. And they were looking for a project to do during the pandemic. They filmed this during the pandemic. And him and Grace wrote the script in a matter of months. And uh, I used to babysit Grace. Uh, I was still pretty young then, oh. but but I was of age. And I mean, I don't know, was Grace seven? Crazy, right? And uh now you go, you know, 16 years later, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's just funny. Um, I was pretty young, but I was of age. You know, you're 21, you could babysit and uh, or past it. And uh, now Grace is a filmmaker. She's a director and they did it together. And I was fortunate to attend the last day of screening and the rap party and just watching them work. And Danny's wife. Uh, Tammy Ann Roebuck was one of the producers and it was like a family affair. It was really unique. Uh, I, I'm really in awe of what they did and I've seen the movie maybe four times now. Uh, at least three, maybe four. We'll call it three. Never get bored of it. I enjoy it. I want to own it on DVD or Blu-ray in my collection. Maybe both because I collect physical media. It seems like you get a lot of satisfaction from just kind of pouring into others and being somewhat of a mentor. Uh, how has that helped uh, with with your with your acting classes and, and your students? What's the dynamic there? Well, enjoy being a mentor. I've had mentors. I've had help uh, along the way. I mentioned Sam Sherman and Albert S. Ruddy uh, of The Godfather, Million Dollar Baby, two-time Oscar winner. When I, I've gone to several meetings in his office, talked to him on the phone, but when I go to LA and I get to meet with him in his office I walk out the door and I feel like I'm walking on air and I call my friend I just met with Al Ruddy you know I have got pictures of his it's Albert S. Ruddy he used to partner Andre Morgan that's not his partner anymore but outside the door I got a picture of his producer's chair which is the director's chair but for a producer and it says Albert S. Ruddy or Albert Ruddy I got a picture with Al in the office. And so I, I've seen the help they've given me and it's never wrong for an actor help. There, there's nothing I'm guilty about. I've gotten help over the years and I enjoy giving back. I made a promise to God. See, I said in this business, you have to believe in something bigger than yourself. I call that something. And if, that. If, if you believe in something bigger than yourself, you're going to go a lot farther. Uh, but I made a promise to God that I would always help others in need years ago. And I've gotten incredible help in my times of need from friends, family, too many to name because I would leave someone out. Uh, even I recently, I had injured my foot that I had told you about and I had a lot of help yeah. from my family, my entire family, but even my brother-in-law, Ron Siegel. And, you know, I, I needed rides and I needed, you know, I couldn't even stay in my home because there were stairs. And so, uh, you know, there, I just I got a lot of help and I've got a lot of help when I was a young artist and even my father and my mother, Sam Borowski and Joel. Back. And I see people like Kevin Brody and Alexandra Doggett and they they could use help. They could use advice. They could use whatever. And I'm happy to give it. And to all of my students, they, if you take my class, 
you can call me on the phone at any time. And if I'm busy, I'll call you right back and ask me, what about this audition? Look at it. Can you help me with it? Do you think it's real? I got it off Craigslist. It's in a back alley. Should I go? Don't laugh. You know about those stories. And I tell them I wouldn't go to this. Or yeah. who's, who's in the short? Or what's the budget? Or um, There's a point where you really can't turn down work. But then there's a point where I've said to Kevin, and I don't know if I've said this to Alex yet, but I've seen her work and it's excellent. And I think uh, if I was her, I would only do top notch work. And so far, the work I've seen has been very good from her. And the filmmakers have been t- there's talented filmmakers upstate. Never knew about them. And not saying I never knew there was filmmakers there, but I'm impressed with the work uh, that, you know, she was in a short I wanted to turn into a feature. And, you know, I look at that and I look at other people's work. When I was at Tribeca one year, I met a, a man named Sean Christensen. He had a short. It was called Curfew. Uh, and I went up to him afterwards and uh, he he wrote a movie called The Abduction with Taylor Lautner and Sigourney Weaver. He does not like it because I guess they changed a lot. But he got it written by Sean. I think I saw that. Yeah, it, it was a decent little thriller. It wasn't the greatest movie ever. It wasn't a terrible movie. It was a decent little thriller. But he said they changed a lot. And, but Sean wrote it. He got it written by credit. I'm sure he sunk the WGA minimum or whatever. He, I don't know what he got. It. It's not my business. Into his short curfew. And I saw curfew and I went out and I said, He's like, oh, no. And I told him about Nightclub and it was coming out. He said, how'd you get that cast? And we just hit it off. And I talked to Sean from time to time, usually on Facebook. He was a great guy and he's uber talented. Now he's a player. What happens? Nominated for an Oscar for Curfew. And he won. And he was there on stage. And I just got so excited. I I know him. I met him. And he won, and to this day, I say Curfew was the best short film I've ever seen of all the Oscar-winning shorts and Oscar-nominated and uh, festival-winning shorts. Curfew, I mean, if you don't have a tear and cry at the end of that movie, you, you, don't, you have a stone in your chest. And his locations in Manhattan are brilliant. Like, he's got a location in Chinatown. It's just visually appealing. They go into an apartment, uh, him and the little girl. He, that's his niece. He, he's he's estranged from his sister and she has to go somewhere in an emergency and she has no one to watch like the 10 year old niece and so she's like I don't trust you Richie but I have no choice so you know he takes her for the night and the only place he can take her is a bowling alley and then uh, she gives him a list bowling alley and he crosses it out and he takes her he wants to go get her like a little gift it's nothing bad but he goes to an apartment where there's a party and there's like it looks like um, the pyramids on the walls of, of the 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 uh, the apartment hallway, just unique. The building where the girl lived, um, unique locations, and even the song at the end, I could still hear it in my head. It, you know, um, it, it was like dun 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 dun. It got you like tapping your toes, and you're like, even the song he picked was great. And that's what filmmaking is. It's the writing, it's the directing, the acting, the producing, the music you choose. Uh, it all plays a role in making a great film. But but Curfew, you should check it out. It's a great short. Okay, I'm definitely adding that to my list. Sean Christensen wrote and directed it. Won the Oscar. Yeah, and what is it specifically? Is there something specific when you're scouting talent that you look for in... Um, in yeah, in a possible actor, actress? You know, uh, it's hard to pinpoint. I look for several things, like passion for the craft, someone who really, sometimes they show it to you and sometimes you could just see inside someone. They say the eyes are the windows to the soul. And you're like, this person cares. They care about the backstory. They uh, That happened like with Alex. Kevin, he was just so exuberant. I met him at a movie theater. He was managing a movie theater, the Cranford Theater at the time um and he great theater by the way uh uh we did a premiere for lucky louis the new jersey premiere there and i went to go see the the last james bond movie um with daniel craig if you haven't seen it uh it's an incredible movie um and uh you know it it, what they did with james 
it was great. No time to die. So I, I went in and I had a t-shirt with like all the different bonds on it, a black t-shirt. It was uh-huh. September and shorts. And he's like, I was dressed down and he's like, he's like, let me guess you're a James Bond fan. When I went to get popcorn and we're talking and he's like, are you a filmmaker? And then he said, I want to talk to you more. I said, after the movie, I'll come out. Theater was closing. I stayed in the lobby for an hour and talked to Kevin. And he said to me, I'll lose my job. I don't care. I want to talk to you right now. And because I said, I don't want to get you in trouble. And right when he said that, I was like, this guy is the kind of guy I would work with. You know, Mm -hmm. Alex, I saw her talent immediately, but there was a passion there. You know, in a movie, when something's not mentioned, but you have to read into it, it's called Beneath the Subtext. And I believe, and this is not nonsense, that beneath the subtext of her, there was a passion for the craft. Uh, You know, Danny Roebuck, I mean, he's much bigger than me. I mean, he helped me when I was younger. Uh, He was like an older brother to me, but he was a a bigger name. I was not a name at that time at all, not even in the indie world. But, you know, he's a collector of like horror movie props and memorabilia. And when you have that kind of passion, it's like, these are the people I want to work. Mary Domino, uh, she, you know, she'll ask you to go over pronunciations of things in her stand-up act. She's been the host at several film festival awards and she'll, she'll go over every name with you, even the obvious ones. Cause she doesn't want to make a mistake. She's professional. And she's just, I've often said Mary Domino is one of the three funniest women on the planet, along with Aubrey Plaza and Aquafina, three very funny women, uh, big Aubrey Plaza fan, but Mary's right there with her. Like uh, she, and Aubrey I mean, Plaza has there. a lot of stuff coming out. Yeah, and Aubrey's just so talented. And you see her in an interview, and you don't know, is she being sarcastic? Is she being poker-faced? Is she being serious? Is she being comedic? It's just, she'll have you cracking up. And uh, I don't understand the part where men always want her to hit them. (laughs) Have you seen that? I want you to run me over with your car. I want you to hit me, Aubrey Plaza. She does this thing where she reads tweets, and she's like, how many people want me to beat them up? And it's really kind of sick, but in a funny kind of way. One guy was like, Aubrey Plaza, I love Aubrey Plaza so much, I would let her stab my eyeball out with a fork oh, uh, just if because it would make her happy. And I was like, where are these people coming from? But I, I guess I'm guilty because I laughed on the when, I, when she read it. I thought it was funny. Her delivery, you know, Mary's like that with the delivery. Mary can make you laugh so hard she'll make you cry. And she could say jokes that are so brutal they'll make you cry. <laughs> I always say Mary's one of the few people I let talk about me the way I, she does. And she has a nickname for me on set. She calls me the Pitbull Buddha because she said on set, That's I'm a like Pitbull. Well, she says, you're like a Pitbull. You're tough. You know, you're like the toughest director, like David O. Russell. But then you're wise in ways that a pit bull wouldn't be, like in ways that the Buddha would be. You're the pit bull Buddha. Yeah, so what is in the pipeline for Sam? All right, so uh, I am in development on a feature called Stay Fresh. I have been for a number of years. Uh, The pandemic slowed us down, and then this injury, which was real bad. uh, uh, I almost lost my foot. Uh, I couldn't walk for seven months. But I'm walking again, which is great. Um, but uh, between those two things, it slowed me down, but it did not stop me. And I'm getting closer from moving from in development to pre-production on Stay Fresh. Uh, in the words of Chili Palmer, John Travolta, that's all I can say about that for now. I am going to be doing a short called um, uh, called uh, After the Rain with Kevin Brody, the aforementioned Kevin Brody, the aforementioned Alexandra Doggett. We have a lot of people in that one. Danny Roebuck uh, was attached. Uh, I got to work out a scheduling. Greg Prosser, who used to be in my class, he does a lot of off-Broadway, a lot of cable TV. Uh, He was on the show Daredevil, a lot of independent films, travels the country with festivals. Uh, He's also going to help me produce it, as will Kevin. Um, And we're about to bring on another producer, Jason John Sikalese. That's one. And I, the problem with that is I have to schedule. I'm getting a SAG waiver. I would, uh, if we use Danny, we have to go by Danny Roebuck's schedule. Um, and Greg's, and uh, I've, I've been snake bitten with that in terms of like, I wanted to film it like four months ago, but I'm going to film that. That's going to be a tune-up for Stay Fresh. 
And I got a number of other things. Kevin and I co-wrote a script. Uh, we co-wrote a script called Irrelevant. Um, mm-hmm. And I also am writing a script with my student, Sarah Harmon. Uh, and we're going to be presenting that to Tiffany Haddish. That's about all I could say. But Tiffany knows about it. And it's called Mitzvah. And in, in, in all of those films that I just mentioned, I actually want to use Mary Danino as well. Because Mary, you know, Mary's Mary's a lot more famous than Kevin or Alex, but she she's just a brilliant actress, funny stand up comedian, and as I said, one of the three funniest women in America. Um, Aubrey Plaza's right there as well, but uh, and Aquafina, but like those are all in the hopper, and I still do my class. And if people want to get in touch with me, they can email Cinematic okay. Heroes C I N E M A T I C. H E R O E S. Everyone forgets that E at the end. Cinematic, it's not H E R O S. It's H E R O E S at AOL.com. Cinematic Heroes, they can rewind it at AOL. I'll have it in the show notes as well. Yeah, at, at AOL.com. And they can inquire about the class. I also do script rewrites. I consult on independent movies. Uh, and I'm willing to work out a fair price in the budget if I like the script and if I want to work with you and if, if, if. But uh, they can also find me on social media. I'm Sam Borowski on Facebook. Um, I think I'm on Instagram. I think I'm Borowski underscore Sam. Uh, or I'm Borowski Sam. I'm one of the, I should know that, right? I'll but, double check uh, that for you. I'll, I'll get in the show notes. But uh, yeah, it's you could see I'm either Borowski or Borowski. You can find me if you go online and do the research. And I, you know, I always enjoy new students recruiting a few right now um i just had a young actress reach out to me that i met this is interesting that I, and i'll be quick i'll be brief i met her two years ago told her about the class she was a bartender and a, and a waitress in this restaurant and she was interested and we talked about manifesting and scripting and god and prayer and she just emailed me the other day like i was too immature then i'm ready so with the students i have i have a bunch that come in and out, but I have four that are regular and that's five. And I have another one I'm looking at. And I hope to, I'm hoping to convince Alex. I said her name a few times. She should come in the class. Right. But she doesn't have to, no pressure. I, I love having brilliant actors. I love, that's one more thing I'll, I'll close with. You said, what do I look for? Great yeah. filmmakers want to work with great actors. If you have talent and you're truly great, whether you're a known actor or an Os, you know, an Oscar winner, you know, whether you're an Oscar nominee like John Travolta has been nominated twice, whether you're Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, whether you're, uh, you know, any big actor out there uh, oh. like Chaz Palminteri from A Bronx Tale, Robert De Niro, who's won his share of Oscars, uh, yeah. Al Pacino or, or Jennifer Lawrence, whether you're any of those, Aubrey Plaza, or whether you are Alexandra Dorgat, Kevin Brody you know, or some person I haven't met yet. Uh, uh, this young girl's name was Genesee. But like, whether you're one of them or one of the others, you're one of them on your way to being one of the others. If you have talent, I want to work with you. If you take it, but if you're professional and it's not a joke and, you know, um, you don't, there's certain things you don't want to reveal on social media if you're in a movie, like filming yourself in a scene and putting it up. Not right. good. That You know, and I or that would allow it or if you're playing a homeless man and you don't shave you shave and you have clean shaven your hair slicked back you you look so clean you could almost smell the cologne the, you know you can almost smell uh what cologne they're wearing and you see them wearing a rolex something that actually happened how can you be a homeless man and look like that that i i can't i yeah. can't it's not serious pt and if you're not serious i don't want to work with you that's that's how I feel. It's not about me and my ego. It's about I want to work with great people. And, uh, you know, all these people I've mentioned are, are great. Mary Domino has done things. Kevin Brody, Alex, Alexandra Dorgett. I, I had a little part in this short. I was like, I hope she takes it. It's not too small for her. And she's like, no, I'm not like that. But she's that talented. I mean, this girl... I don't tell people they could be movie stars because that's usually be nonsense. This girl could, when you see her act, her talent, her look, uh, 
And I hope she believes it after hearing this. Uh, Kevin, yeah. Kevin's got a lot about him beyond the acting and the writing and the, he's learning producing. And he helped me put on that New Jersey premiere. He co-hosted it and he learned a lot about the business and getting people there. And, you know, and as I said, Mary's one of the three funniest women in America. Like if you have various qualities and she could do drama as well, you know, these are the things I look for. And, uh, I would love to get some new uh, actors and new clients if you want if you want me to talk about your independent film and help get you actors uh, advice on the script, rewrite it. Like I said, I, I, I do consulting and tell you how. But if you're going to do an independent, you can't get money for a couple of big character actors with recognizable faces and you've never heard of the music and it's not a perfect film. No, you're not getting distribution. You're not getting it in theaters. You know, you need to have some recognizable faces for your poster names. Now, there are movies without big names, but they have to have an interesting and unique story and a hook. Something about the story that's different. Um, you look at a movie that I'll, I'll close with this. This is McDormand. What she won? Three Oscars. But the yes. thing is, one of which for Nomadland. It also, if they didn't have Francis McDormand, and they didn't have, a, they had her and David Strathern. Uh, they were like the two big actors. Everyone else was like either up and coming or real nomads who who are, you know, there was a bunch of real people. And then there's that guy, Bob, what's his name? He has the actual then living channel. He's in the movie as himself. And, uh, and I should know his last name, but it's it had a hook because people are now getting into the van life culture and, you know, living in their vans and in not just RVs, their vans and in small vans and I think there's something to that. And I think you look at, you know, the economy in America and that's their way to not just scrape by, but live a little better because they don't have rent and they have great lives. And I mean, I, I, that movie made me cry. That was my favorite movie of the year. And I remember at the end, they say uh, in this life, we don't say uh, they were talking about someone who passed on. We don't say uh, goodbye. We say, see you down the road. Because we will see that person down the road, whether it's three months or six months or a year or five years or 10 years, we'll see them down the road. And they said that, uh, I think when they won the Oscar, see you down the road. And I, I, I always liked that. And there was a hook to that movie. And Chloe Zhao did an incredible job as a director. Uh, you know, I don't care where you're from. I don't care if you're male. I don't care if you're female, uh, you know, what religion, ra yeah, obviously I have my religion, but I don't force it on others. My What religion, race, creed, if you're great, you're great. She was great. And uh, what she did with that movie, uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's, but it's, you won it's, the Oscar, so. Yeah, won oh, Best Picture. And Academy it, felt the same way. When you, you see it, it's a very human, interesting movie. And the places that Frances McDormand goes to, uh, things she didn't have to do at her stature and her age, I mean, they show her bathing in a pool of nature, like it's like a river, and she's naked. The, yeah, I saw, and, I and saw the it. You saw it in the very opening scene. She's squatting down to go to the bathroom on the side of the road. And I'm not making fun of anything. I'm saying I have much respect for her for doing that because she didn't have to. But that, you know what? She's an actor. She's what they call a thespian. It's in her blood. And that's, that's what I respect in a nutshell. Yes. Totally get it. Well, this has been awesome and it's such a pleasure. And I've just been learning so much. You've, you're taking us to school. You've taken us to school. I <laughs> feel like you it. took me to school. You helped me live it. And every time <laughs> I meet someone new, they yeah. inspire me. Uh, some actors more than others have really inspired me and they make me want to keep going. That's excellent. It's a pleasure, Sam, having you. All the very best on your projects. Hopefully you come back you want and it was a pleasure being here and i'm going to close with and you know what i'm going to close with adios god bless and stay fresh thank you for listening to 
journaling with PT and my conversation with the wonderful filmmaker Sam Borowski. I apologize for the sound quality. There were a lot of technical issues, but I believe it was a great conversation and there's a lot that can be learned. If you want to reach out to, to Mr. Borowski, contact him at cinematicheroes at aol.com. Continue to support the podcast by following, giving a five-star reading, and stay tuned.